Story time with Grandma. The little ones all gathered around Grandma. Their upturned faces like sunflowers facing the sun. This was the part of the holidays that they liked best. Even the older ones, the teenagers, and the mums and dads made themselves available for story time with Grandma. It was a much loved family ritual because she was a fantastic storyteller. She made the wolves and the little pigs and the family of bears and the wicked witches so believable. Their characters developed beautifully in her skillful hands. and her voice and her face and her actions made them come alive even when the children read the stories later it was grandma's voice telling the story that they really remembered but story time was beyond even that it was about real stories stories from her own past her adventures around the world with grandpa who sat grumpily alongside in his rocking chair and could hardly be believed to have had any of those crazy escapades though everyone always believed them of grandma and what was equally good if not actually better stories about her children the little one's parents when they were kids these were the most fun because the particular adult about whom the story was would squirm with embarrassment and there would be great shrieks of laughter and plenty of good-natured teasing the room was full as always you would kick yourself mighty hard if you missed story time grandpa harumphed away in his rocking chair grandma beamed down at her audience today's story is about lena when she was very young 4 or 5 perhaps as young as you rohan and younger even than you ramya oh mom protested lena flushing trying to remember what it would have been that her mom was going to embarrass her with today she looked crestfallen but grandma on a story tale was a juggernaut she could only gird her loins and prepare for the ride her kids giggled with wicked delight This was their lucky day. Lena was always a clever thing even as a small girl. She used to listen to the grown-ups and learn things. Too often she didn't understand what she had heard and she would repeat these very adult sounding things and get herself in all kinds of trouble. Once when I had taken Hari and Lena to somebody's house I reminded them both to say thank you as we were leaving and Lena asked loudly for what they never gave us anything the hostess heard of course and it was so embarrassing but it happened to be true i had to explain to her later that while it was correct that one must be truthful one must also always be polite the tikes were hooting turning around and looking at Lena But this was an old story and the rest of us knew better stuff was coming now this is about a time when lena was sick radha came to our bedroom late one night and complained that lena was muttering and moaning in her sleep and wouldn't shut up it could have been just bad dreams but it could also have been a delirium like when you get very high fever So I hurried over to check on her and yes she was fiery hot I sent Radha off to sleep in my room and I nursed Lena through that night The bed sheets were all tangled with her kicking her face and neck were flushed and hot but her hands and feet were cold and her eyeballs were racing under her closed eyelids I gave her some medicine and sponged her down to cut the fever She had been playing out in the heat all day with her brothers and I was hoping it might just be a touch of the sun. But when morning came and Lena was still flushed and delirious, I decided I'd better send for the doctor. And the good man came even before his breakfast 
because he knew I wouldn't call him needlessly. He checked her out thoroughly, bending her hands and legs, looking into her eyes and down her throat with his torch. He listened to her breath and checked her racing pulse and tucked his thermometer into her armpit. Her temperature was 103, he said, but it didn't look serious. And with paracetamol and good home nursing, she should be running around again soon not to worry. 103 is a very high temperature for a little girl, doctor. She's only five. But he reassured me, and he had seen me through plenty of scrapes with this brat pack. So though I was worried, I accepted his word. Just then, Lena started up in her bed and asked nervously, How much is my fever, doctor? Giving me a conspiratorial smile, he patted her arm and said she was not to worry because we would take care of all that. She was just to rest and obey her mother and soon she would be right as rain. But her face crumpled and she was ready to cry. You said 103, she whimpered. I heard you. I knew she would work herself up into a frenzy if we didn't tell her. So I told her it was 103, but she was not to fret and I'd be back as soon as I'd seen the doctor away. I was gone only a few minutes, but when I came back, she was sobbing and rubbing her face and eyes vigorously with the bed sheets. She pulled the sheets over her head when she saw me and tried to swallow her tears and fears, but the hiccups came bursting through. I tucked myself into the bed next to her and cuddled her and told her that she'd soon be fine, but she still blubbered and shuddered with sobs. So I stroked her lovingly and whispered songs in her ear until finally the sweet child fell into an exhausted sleep. Many of the babes in the audience were a bit wet-eyed by now. I sponged her and changed her wet clothes and cooled her fevered brow all day and dosed her regularly with her medicines. Often I'd catch her crying silently, so she would bravely try to stop when I appeared. But she wouldn't tell me what was upsetting her, no matter how gently or how insistently I asked. And she kept telling me to go away and leave her alone. Not in a rude way, in a sweet, loving way. Go away, mum. You don't have to sit with me all the time. I kept telling her she'd be fine in a day or two and then I'd go away. And she'd smile at me weakly and weep some more. It was very odd behaviour. When her brothers and sister came home from school, I sent them in to visit her and told them to be kind because she was very upset about something. She hugged them tight and cried copiously over them and told them she loved them. And Hari and Ramesh rushed out as fast as they could and even Radha came out saying there was something very strange going on. I took her a little soft food and as I was spooning it into her mouth, she said again that I shouldn't trouble so much with her. So I got very upset and told her strictly that she must tell me what she was so afraid of. She burst into great jagged sobs and cried and cried till she was exhausted. Now will you tell me what's going on? I said to her in a very firm voice. And finally, with many sniffings and rubbings of her eyes and nose, she admitted in a soft, soft voice, I know I'm going to die, Mum, and I don't want you to get sick and die because of me. Many of the little ones were now openly sobbing at poor Lena who was going to die. They knew she was in the room with us, but yet they were caught up in the spiraling emotion of the story. I didn't know whether to be relieved or angry. This poor little mite had been tormenting herself all day and I had only managed to get it out of her late in the evening. You're not going to die, you silly goose. Didn't you hear the doctor saying you'll be running around right as rain in a few days? He is lying, she wailed at me. 
he is lying because you said my fever is 103 well so what if it's 103 you'll get better and it will come down again but all this silly crying and fussing is making you ill and you can't get better till you stop it and relax you're lying to me now mama you're lying to me because i know i'm dying because i've got 103 and why would 103 make you die young lady i scolded exasperated with her stubbornness because when Mohan, Uncle and Sita Auntie came here once and all your big people were talking, Sita Auntie said, no one can possibly live with a fever of 44. And Mohan Uncle said, she should know because she's a nurse and mine is 103, so I'm surely, surely going to die. And I don't want you to die because of me. So leave me alone, Mom, and I'll be brave and I'll try to die without crying. <laughs> By this time, the adults had started guffawing and throwing playful punches at Lena, who was red as a beetroot, and some of the elder kids had figured it out too, but the little ones were still looking befuddled. So, Grandma had to explain how you could die with a fever of 44 degrees if it was Celsius, but still easily survive with 103 degrees if it was Fahrenheit. She compared it to meters and feet, which even the tots understood from when they had their height taken. And suddenly, they realized this was a funny story and that Lena was still amongst us and started laughing loudly with the slight hysteria which comes from the release of too much tension. I finally calmed her down and at long last she went to sleep peacefully. And the next morning, she was just a normal sick girl Cranky, because she was hot and confined, but not tearful or miserable as before. And now that she knew she was going to live, she wanted me near her every single minute, telling her stories and singing her songs. But I was so happy that she was at peace again that I never minded all the bother. Luckily, she started getting better quickly. And all of us are really happy Lena didn't die that day, but I'll never forget how sweetly she begged me to leave her alone so that I wouldn't die because of her. Grandma smiled lovingly upon her younger daughter and Lena looked foolish and happy at the same time. Two of the tiddlers jumped up to give Lena big hugs and thanked her for not dying, with Lena saying she was mighty thankful for that herself and wanting to save Grandma when she was only five years old and so scared herself. And Lena's kids smirked and told the others it was only natural for a tiny baby of five to get confused. Even curmudgeonly old Grandpa patted the nearest heads and beamed at everyone. And all of us felt this was another grand story, since the room was overflowing with warmth and tenderness and family feeling which is exactly what makes Grandma the best storyteller in the whole world and why none of us ever misses a single session of story time with Grandma. and raise you five. Grandma was a legendary raconteur's and was always in demand to tell stories. The fertile concoctions of her brain remained a source of pride and joy to all of us who knew her and claimed her as our own. Within the bosom of the family, the most delightful tales were the old family stories of Grandpa and herself and their exciting adventures around the world in a time when travel was rare and dangerous. Of her own parents and siblings and most especially of her kids and their shenanigans. These last were always the greatest fun. 
the victims would know they were to be royally embarrassed about some childhood indiscretion and would squirm their way through the whole proceedings, adding to our delight. The room would be suffused with laughter, yes, but also with love and warmth, and everyone would feel the strong embrace of family. It was very special indeed. We settled ourselves all over the room on couches and chairs and sprawled on the carpets with cushions and pillows. No one ever missed story time. Not even Grandpa, who had lived through many of these events in real time. He settled in his rocking chair with his usual grumpy face and prepared himself to be entertained. Today's story is about Radha started Grandma. Everyone tittered with excitement and Radha's kids actually rubbed their hands in glee. Their ship was coming home this evening. Radha, of course, was woebegone. She hid her head in her hands and groaned audibly. Satish put his arm around her shoulders and comforted her. But Grandma's stories were never malicious. So Rat raised her chin and decided to tough it out, giving her mum a threatening look, but throwing her a wink too. Okay, do your worst, mum, she declared, bringing forth more chuckles. The sunflower faces all turned back to grandma expectantly as she launched into the story. Radha was the first child in the family to go to the prestigious IIT. Engineering was still a boy's study subject in those days, Grandma said, as the little ones booed her. I know, I know that's sexist, but it was true then. Girls usually studied literature or home sciences. Now, no more scolding, that was many years ago. Anyway, there were ructions. She'd got admitted in Chennai or Madras, as we called it then, and would be going away to hostel. Grandpa and I had to arrange so many things for her and to defend her choice and our actions before the court of our family and friends. We weren't entirely convinced ourselves, but the more we defended her, the more convinced we became. The time came to settle her in her dorm and say our farewells and we left her in the beautiful leafy campus and came away feeling a little nervous. Once a week she would phone and tell us how it was. Tough, hard work, constant challenges, but also friends from all over the country, both boys and girls. Rubbishy food, long hours of work, short hours of sleep. And I know she sent you long letters, Satish. Losing precious sleep time writing them, Grandma pointed accusingly at Satish. And Rad and Satish grinned sheepishly and the kids whooped. Our Radha was progressing well with her study. But she would always be exhausted when she came back in the term breaks and thin as a rail. And I'd feed her all her favourite foods and let her sleep around the clock until she wore out the worst of it. And in a few days, she'd be back in the saddle, poring over her books or sneaking off to meet Satish thinking we didn't know anything. Ha! I have eyes in the back of my head and she couldn't put her foot down without my knowledge. Grandpa glared fiercely at Satish, but Satish sketched him a salute and Grandpa couldn't keep up the mock glare after that even though his girls were his darlings and the sons-in-law were the bête noir. The little ones made loud kissing sounds. Hush up, you lot, Radha hissed at them. Really, mum, get on with your story and stop with the histrionics. Grandpa and I could see the way things were going with Radha and Satish. And sure enough, one day Satish came very properly to Grandpa and asked if they could get married. Everything was happily settled, though there was no time for a formal engagement with a ring and a party, as Radha had to return to Madras. 
We were delighted that she had found herself a nice, decent lad. Whoops again, and Satish grinning as if it was high praise, and Rat giving him a little cuddle right there in front of all the kids, and the kissing sounds starting up again. Grandpa and I decided to visit Our Lady of Velenkani to give our thanks. And naturally, we could visit Radha at IIT on the way. We stayed at a small hotel near the campus. We met her professors and friends and all had such kind things to say about her that she was progressing brilliantly. Rad pointed to her kids and cupped her ear at them. Listen and follow in my footsteps, she seemed to say. Be brilliant. Both the boys looked deliberately away, pretending they couldn't see or hear. All the charades on the sidelines of Grandma's tales were so much a part of the fun. We had an early train the next day. So after dinner and sending Radha off safely back to the campus, we were ready to turn in when there was an unexpected knock on the door. Rad let out a terrific yelp. Oh, Mum, did you have to pull out this old chestnut after all these years? Okay, go on, she muttered resignedly. I live it down. Everyone turned expectantly to Grandma, who gave Rad a quizzical look. The room was hushed. The real story was coming now. Grandpa opened the door. Grandpa rocked harder and nodded to confirm this. It was a man, 40-ish, fat belly reaching out ahead and almost through his shirt, shiny round scalp peering through a scanty comb over and a briefcase in his hand. He informed Grandpa that he was a professor at IIT, though he did not teach Radha, and that he would like to talk to us on a personal matter. We were both alarmed. What could possibly be the problem? We escorted him downstairs to the hotel lounge on the edge of nervousness and fortunately found a quiet corner to talk in. Coffees were offered and orders placed. Finally, Grandpa encouraged him to tell us his personal matter. Did it concern our Radha? Indeed it did, he said. He'd been observing her. She was diligent in her work. Her professors had only praise for her. She was a clever and independent thinker, which was an admirable thing. In a girl. Indignant cries burst from the penny seats at this new instance of deplorably sexist thinking. She was friendly too, he added, and her friends were all decent people from good families and doing well academically. He'd observed her to be polite and decently dressed and well-behaved. Initially, we were delighted with his compliments. Then, all these remarks of good behavior started having the opposite effect on us. Who was this man to talk about her behavior or her dress, decent or otherwise? The colossal nerve to talk to us about our daughter in this manner? So Grandpa asked him where this conversation was going. And he hesitated slightly, then stood up, adjusted his collar, before saying in a most theatrical way that he would like to offer himself as a suitor for her hand. Grandma stopped strategically and all of us just sat there stunned for a second. And then a huge hullabaloo started up, screaming and yelling from the girls and thumping and stomping from the boys. Lena accused her sister with big bulging eyes. You never told us, Rad, you mean old thing. Rad twisted her mouth like a small child and Satish kept his arm protectively around her. Grandpa looked proud, as if he had just won a prize. Grandpa was equal to him. Grandma called us back to attention and thanked him for his kind offer, but Radha was already engaged. That threw the chap back a few paces. Engaged, he repeated, but I'm sure she's not wearing a ring. Grandpa told him grandly 
that was as the case might be, but as our father, he knew it to be a fact. We both stood up, and leaving the coffees quite undrunk, we indicated that the interview was over. We thanked him for his courtesy and wished him well in his search for a bride. We never gave him a chance to talk after that. Decently dressed indeed. As always, Grandma's story was a bombshell and we were all cheering and teasing Rad and Satish. Their sons formally thanked Satish for being a slender, tall and handsome father with plenty of hair and all of us were chattering and shouting over each other. And that's when Rad chimed in, in a history-making codicil to Grandma's story. No one had ever pipped Grandma to the post, before or since. She said, You don't know the end of that story, Mum, because I never told you. Worry rippled briefly over Grandma's features but flitted away as she saw Rat smiling. After you sent my ancient suitor off with a flea in his ear, he summoned me to his study the next day. I hardly knew who he was and wondered why I had been called. But of course, I didn't know what had transpired the previous night. So, I went along innocently and presented myself as commanded. He didn't even ask me to sit down, but straight away started berating me about being engaged and not wearing a ring and giving decent people the wrong impression and that he was very upset that I had not waited for him and I should not behave in such an irresponsible manner leading young men up the wrong path. I had no idea what he was talking about and was stunned that he should know I was engaged when I had not mentioned it at IIT at all. That's when he told me he had met you the night before and all that had happened. We were holding our sides and guffawing, rolling around on the floor, screaming with laughter. Grandma had her hand on her mouth, but her eyes were twinkling like stars on a cloudless night. The prof had ticked her off soundly for leading him on, Rad said. And finally, she decided she'd had enough of it. Wait for him? She hardly even knew he existed. She told him she was sorry he'd been embarrassed but he had only himself to blame going directly to her parents in this day and age without having spoken to her first, since she'd have disabused his hopes fairly quickly. In any case, he was way too old for her, or any other student for that matter. That deflated him considerably, Rat said, and she had bitten back the cruel comment that he wasn't exactly Adonis either and would hardly have been the stuff of any young girl's dreams. She'd been tempted to give him a good dressing down for being such a presumptuous turkey cock. But the air had gone poof out of him, so she'd felt pity and choked back her righteous wrath. She did tell him off for subjecting her parents to such a stressful interview, and that too on the night before a pilgrimage. By this time, he was looking completely crestfallen. And so she'd brought the meeting to a close by assuring him that she would keep the matter confidential and by advising him to look outside the student body for his life partner in future. She walked back to her dorm in high dudgeon, but the busyness of the work had pushed the disturbing incident to the back of her mind. And when mum and dad never brought it up, neither did she, unburdening only to Satish and then consigning it to the dustbin of useless memories. Cheers went up. Good old rat. Grandma summoned her eldest daughter and wagged her finger at her and made a futile pretense of being annoyed. You're a naughty girl for keeping secrets from your mother, Radha. I didn't know you knew anything about it at all. Your dad and I decided it was best to conceal it from you. Rad chortled happily. And Grandpa rocked his chair and mumbled something about love being in the air. And all of us remember this story so well because it's the only time in living memory that Grandma got trounced at her own tail.
Grandpa picks up the baton. We'd all bundled out of the room in a tumbling throng, laughing and giggling. But now we were hanging around the corridor in a seething, broiling, nail-biting mass. The doctor was inside the room with our beloved grandma and grandpa, and he couldn't come out soon enough to reassure us. Grandma had wanted a holiday in the hills, and we grandchildren had taken it as a God-given edict. She enjoyed day one, but by day two, she was panting and unusually sapped of energy. The front desk was besieged by a worried third-gen army, expecting the doctor to be instantly teleported to her side and having no patience for the realities of him being on his way. At last, he arrived, and the eldest, Ina, explained the situation. The kindly-looking man approached Grandma, and the very first question he asked her was, "How old are you, Madam?" He almost jumped out of his skin when the room erupted in raucous laughter. "You tell him, Grandma! You tell him!" We encouraged her. She skewered us with her eyes, and answered him with an absolutely straight face, "I'm twelve." It was left to Ina to explain that it was a long-standing family joke that she'd never confessed to more than that, despite being overtaken even by her grandchildren. The doctor was amused, but clearly on her side, as he threw us all out, insisting he needed privacy to examine his patient, which is why we were all fretting in the corridors. No one wanted Grandma to sicken under our watch. We'd been delighted to be able to gratify her simple wish and bring her up here. We had to take her back, hale and hearty and strong as ever. We pounced on him as he exited the room, and we were so relieved when he said she needed only rest and no exertion till we left for home as scheduled in two days. The altitude had affected her, and he would have sent her back to the plains ASAP. But she'd begged prettily to be permitted to enjoy her small holiday, and had promised to be good. We were charged to ensure this, and of course, we readily agreed. Ina escorted him downstairs and dispatched a hotel runner to fill the prescription. She came back to find us strewn all over the room. Grandma was tucked up in bed, and Grandpa was sitting in an upright chair next to her, looking officious. Ina, Grandpa's going to tell us a story. Can you believe it? We shrieked at her. She tried earnestly to be strict and to shoo us off so Grandma could rest, but Grandma herself was agog to hear Grandpa's story. So Ina lost that battle. Though she warned Grandma, she'd be keeping a gimlet eye on her. It was inconceivable that Grandpa was taking over story time. None of us could ever remember such a thing. He must be deeply concerned about Grandma. I married your grandmother when I was eighteen, and she was only twelve. He started, and instantly there was an uproar. Twelve? That was illegal, surely. Not then, admitted Grandma. I stayed with my parents for another four years, but yes, I was married when I was twelve. It's true. And how old were you after those four years, Grandma? Someone cheekily asked her. Twelve, she intoned, equally cheekily. And even then, they would have kept her longer if I hadn't forced the issue. Chuckled Grandpa. She's still a vision of delight, he said, and he couldn't have chosen an audience that agreed with him more. She was the linchpin of our family, and every one of us adored her. She's still a vision of delight, but when we were both young, mwah, 
Grandpa smacked his bunched fingers and held them up to the heavens as witnessed. At twelve, she'd been sweet and pretty. But at sixteen, oh, 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 she was ravishing. He tittered over his passions. Grandma looked inordinately pleased and Grandpa harumphed away happily, awash in his fond memories. I'd visited her home often after we were married, so I'd got to know her quite well. She was clever as a kite and skilled in the home and kitchen, but extremely strong-willed. Her sisters and brothers served dutifully under her command, often even her parents. The only person who wouldn't bend to her will was I, which didn't increase my popularity with her. Oh, dearest, that is most unfair, broken grandma, and was summarily shushed. Shh, shh, shh. This was grandpa's story, and she had to let him tell it his way. We let her add only that grandpa was tall, over six feet, the tallest man she'd ever seen, and the handsomest. And while she'd been bashful, Yes, even she. She'd been completely under his spell. She would eavesdrop jealously on every word he said to anybody in the house. The servants, her siblings, her parents, and even the dogs. This was just too much for some of us. Who thinks of your grandparents, all grey-haired and wrinkly, as having had a torrid love story? It was the sweetest thing ever. She'd just turned 16, and I took her a valuable gold ornament for her hair as a birthday gift. I'd made up my mind I was not returning without her. It caused a commotion, but finally her parents gave in and agreed to send her. I was proud of my persuasiveness, and got to know only years later that I'd only succeeded because she'd stopped eating and drinking entirely until they agreed to send her with me. That sounded like our grandma, and he got sympathetic murmurs from his audience. Trunks and bundles were packed with clothes and kitchen vessels and jewellery and gifts for my parents and siblings. Much had been accumulated in the four years since the wedding, and some had already been sent across. But now everything had to be rushed. The monsoon had started, and two streams had to be crossed on the way home, they could become engorged and dangerous. Having insisted and got my way, I was now a tad nervous. I couldn't retract, but going ahead was fraught with concern too. A week later, we set off in three Tongas. Have any of you fancy fellows ridden a Tonga? We hesitantly offered up the horse carriages we had circled the Victoria Memorial in knowing full well we would get mocked. He rounded on us scornfully. Cha! Namby Bambies! That's a fancy horse and carriage, British era. I'm talking of the humble village Tonga. It's just a bamboo platform on a cart, covered if you're lucky, pulled by a single sturdy farm horse. Big wooden wheels rimmed with metal, rumbled easily over dirt tracks but would break your back on these modern tarred roads. I was a flying fury in my days and the fastest and the most adept with my Tonga. But a new bride is a new bride and a furious river is not something to be trifled with. Two carts were loaded with her possessions and gifts and in the third were my princess, her personal maid, a cotton-stuffed mattress as luxury seating, and myself at the reins. Her parents begged me to stay till the waters receded, but I'd accepted their hospitality too long already. Everything went tip-top till we approached the first stream. It was rough. Grandma stayed inside her cart pacifying her maid who was crying desperately, certain that these were her last hours on earth. I consulted the other Tongawalas. They were confident. This was manageable. They had tackled much worse. The villagers concurred. It just needed experienced drivers 
and all three of us were well qualified. Sure enough, we were soon safely on the other side, boasted Grandpa. In an hour, we reached the next stream. But this one was quite another kettle of fish. The villagers assured us it was safe. It was fast flowing, but shallow. It was scary to look at, and the other drivers were balking. I was familiar with it and I knew its vagaries well, but it was new to them and it certainly looked violent enough to give pause. This was a seemingly insurmountable problem. There was no suitable place for a lady to spend the night. There was no way back and the only way forward required gumption. For myself and my trusted horse Sultan, I would never have hesitated. But with two women, one already wailing to her household gods and ancestors, oh dear. Grandpa ran completely out of words. But your grandma was no ninny, he restarted his story. She convinced the maid to stay in the village. A safe refuge was sought for her and she agreed cheerfully, only commencing her wailing again when she realized grandma wasn't joining her. She was loath to abandon her ward, but ultimately far more loath to abandon her life, which she was sure she would if she challenged the frothing waters. The Tongawalas were convinced to stay behind too, ostensibly to protect her and bring her safely home when the waters abated. Grandma vowed she'd never let me go ahead without her, and I'd crossed that stream too many times before to be unnerved by it. I assured her I'd never put her in danger, that Sultan and I had crossed it in far more violent conditions, and that it was all froth and not as much fury as it appeared to be. But I might as well have saved my breath to cool my porridge. She was in for the adventure. She wedged herself into the tonga sideways with her legs and her back and got ready to grab me tight as I launched myself into the driver's seat. I don't know if she thought she, with her tiny frame, could hold me back if the waters decided to pull me from her. But I wasn't going to object to being hugged now, was I? The wicked rascal chortled. Grandma blushed, rosily, remembering her boldness of so many years ago, and it was deliciously sweet to watch them. That was the day I knew for sure this was the perfect woman for me. I was ever the daredevil, an adventurer, and a wife who wailed and tried to hold me back from everything for fear of my dying would have been a major encumbrance. This one was already showing she had the mettle to be a worthy partner. The whole village watched, and the Tongawalas too, and the silly maid screeched and yelled and called on the heavens to protect her tender charge. But with my wife's firm arms around my waist and her cheek pressed tight against my back and Sultan under my command, we carefully and sturdily picked our way through the frothing white waters that didn't even rise high enough to wet the seat of the Tonga. We had a few slips and rushes and got pulled and pushed about a bit, but nothing we hadn't expected. With waves and cheers to the other side, we charged off home. And instead of the hero's welcome I should have received, I was greeted with semi-hysteria that I had put a young girl through this terrible ordeal. And this particular genteelly brought up young girl at that. But the young girl in question herself was flushed with excitement and the thrill of her first adventure. Once she'd got her taste of it, Nothing could ever hold her back. Our first spousal journey together became the start of a life filled with many risks, thrills and adventures. And I declare, I chose me the best little wife in the whole world for all she was just a mite of twelve. Considering how good a judge I proved to be of these matters, I should have gone into horse racing. I'm sure I could have chosen the winners straight out of their mother's wombs and made myself a pretty packet. I missed my vocation, I think. Mm -hmm. The crafty old rascal grinned 
and winked at his first and best choice. Grandma playfully threatened to beat him and the lot of us fell upon him, offering to do the deed for her until Ina broke in, saying it had been a long enough session for Grandma and she needed her rest. Just then, the hotel boy arrived with Grandma's medicines and while Ina sorted them out, all of us jumped up to settle them in with their books and reading glasses, water, phone and whatever else they needed at hand before we trooped out, still discussing how no one was going to believe Grandpa had told us a story and how manfully he'd acquitted himself, not just on that stream long ago, but today in the storytelling. We'd never suspected the curmudgeonly old codger to have had it in him. He'd proved to be no less a raconter than Grandma. She'd better get well soon and protect her turf if she didn't want competition from within the family. When the time is right. We started in the usual way, milling about in the living room, eating, drinking, chatting. The men were quieter, as always, we women carrying the burden of the conversation. The kids would come in later. Lena was telling us how she'd caught Ramya fiddling with her makeup drawer and how difficult it had been to explain to her that she wasn't old enough for this yet when all her friends apparently used blusher, lipstick and even mascara sometimes. There were general expressions of lamentation. Ramya was only six, for God's sake. Suddenly, Hari piped up from the other side of the room. It was ages ago, he said, but he'd had something like this happen to him, hadn't he, Ma? To hear him tell it, his mother had walked into the room as he was examining her lipsticks. I forgot to tell you, I'm playing Draupadi in our college production. Rehearsals start this evening. He drummaged in her drawer. He wanted to choose a good colour. And how was he to know what a good colour was? Really, it was so much easier being a man, blue shirts or white or beige, and not too much else in the colour department to worry about. It was odd that no one else seemed to remember the incident. Except Grandpa. He'd gone a mottled and splotchy red, like he'd had too much sun. Grandma had gone silent too. And her smile looked forced. Oh, ho, ho! Something was amiss. Everyone's eyes were flicking from grandma to grandpa, wondering who would say something. Hari was the funniest. What? What am I missing here? I was the best Draupadi the college had ever seen. Ma, surely you remember. Your tailor made that complicated blouse with all the fussy buttons down the front. And the petticoat with the too tight nada. And I wore saris for a month. His sisters and brothers chimed in vociferously. They remembered that bit, traipsing around the house in a sari like a girl. They teased him about it at first, but he'd not risen to the bait at all. So they'd given up on it soon enough. It was a non-event. Hari was triumphant. That's how I got the role, he crowed. The drama master picked me, saying I was the coolest kid in the batch and would I be willing to play Draupadi? Female roles always being a problem in a boys' college. It was just an act. But if I was going to do it, I was going to do it well. Not look like an obvious clunker in a sari. I was slight enough then to be able to carry it off. Fresh guffaws from his siblings and wicked smirks all around. For now, not even his fond ma could call him slight. 
I'd had a bit of notice, so I started channeling my feminine side a few weeks in advance. And once the rehearsal started, I was full on. Lipstick, sari, bindi, how to sit, how to walk, how to speak. The walk was the hardest. Couldn't copy Ma, sorry Ma, but I couldn't. And couldn't copy the sexy young things. Hey, this was Draupadi. She couldn't be swinging her hips. That was a terrific challenge. But I mastered it, eventually. I was stunning, even if I say so myself. All of us were laughing fit to die, but Grandma had an indecipherable expression on her face. And Grandpa looked like he would explode. And then he did explode. He sat up straight in his old rocker. His eyes were burning and there was smoke pouring out of his nostrils and ears or it sure looked like that. The laughter was abruptly arrested. We didn't know what had incensed him, but it was major. Anyone could see that. Grandma broke the silence. It's okay, my dear. Perhaps it is time to explain. Hari was too engrossed with the whole act and the others were a bit young to be aware. Grandpa was still fuming. The agonies you put us through, you insensitive ass! You have no idea! Hari was clearly nonplussed. Grandma took charge of the story. Hari was in college and the others were still young. He suddenly became secretive about his friends and activities was late for everything, looked either scruffy or too groomed and seemed never to study or ever to have time for family. All matters we later discovered to be typical boyish behaviour at this age but Hari was our eldest and all this was new to us so we were greatly worried. Then one day, without any prior indication, he became overly feminine. Walking delicately, talking softly, eyes gentler, gestures smaller. Hari pumped his fist. Yes! He muttered half to himself. The rest of us instantly cottoned on. But Hari was still reliving his Draupadi triumph and the ring of applause in his ears was evidently drowning out what Grandma was trying to say. She could see we were on track and nodded silently, courageously getting a grip on herself. Rad, who was sitting next to her, put her arm around her and Grandma patted her knee. Grandpa and I discussed it, she said. Hari was slowly beginning to realize that this was not about his Oscar-worthy performance. Grandpa wanted to talk to Hari about it, but I wouldn't let him. I insisted that we should love and support our son and if this was who he was, that was it. We would stand by him and face whatever music we had to. We would not make him feel bad about something he had no control over. Hari was finally on board. Ma! Pa! I can't believe this is happening. It was method acting for God's sake. I have to admit I was laughing and crying at the same time. Laughing at my poor frantic Hari, desperate to save his macho image, but crying for dear grandma and grandpa. How terrible it must have been for them all those years ago. It's still not easy, even nowadays. But then, it must have felt like a hundredweight falling on them. And they'd valiantly decided to put his happiness first, no matter what, and brave whatever storms descended. It was heroic, to say the very least. Hari was at his ma's feet now, looking beseechingly into her face. Full realization was dawning and it was such a powerful and intimate moment that all of us just shrank back as if we weren't there. Grandma stroked Hari's head wordlessly, her heart too full of remembered pain to speak. And Grandpa snorted, Acting, indeed! 
That broke the ice and laughter rolled like thunder around us. Hari stayed at grandma's feet and hung on to her knees, obviously tormented at the anxiety he'd caused. Grandma finished the story quickly after that. We agonized over it, but I was unshakable. Hari was not to be reprimanded or even questioned. Then the lipstick episode and the revelation about the Draupadi role. Then further recriminations. Had the drama master noticed something we as parents hadn't? Why else had he assigned this role to Hari? Because I'm the cool guy. This stuff doesn't bother me. It was just a bloody act. Sorry, Ma, that slipped out. But I'm under a lot of stress here. You're under stress, roared Grandpa. And the rest of us burst out in fresh rounds of muffled giggles. We understood their pain. But with hindsight, it was a really funny story. And hanging on to our seriousness was hard. Then all the sari wearing... Ma picked up the thread of the story again. But strangely, it was only at home. Outside, Hari always seemed the same as before, which was confusing. Then the play in college and the repeated curtain calls for Draupadi at the end. And we clapped and cheered like everyone else and commanded our sore hearts to be silent and celebrate Hari's triumph. At this point of the story, Hari was actually crumpled on the floor in front of his ma. The day after the play, the affected behavior just dropped away, like the much-wanted albatross. This confused us all over again. We waited and watched and finally had the courage to discuss it with each other. It seemed it had been just an act for the Draupadi role. Gentle probing with Hari at the dining table revealed that he'd known about the casting long before the lipstick episode and that had finally put the seal on the situation. Grandma admitted frankly that while she'd been willing to support him to the ends of the earth, she'd been hugely relieved that she didn't actually have to. Confabulations had been entered into with Grandpa and it had been decided... Grandpa interjected that he'd been overruled. Nevertheless, it had been decided that no word was to be said. Ever. Now Grandma tried to lift Hari's head from her knee, where it had found a resting place. But Hari was disconsolate. Where his youthful self had been callous and thoughtless, now he could not apologize or beg forgiveness enough. Grandma, of course, absolved him readily, too readily for his massive guilt. So his pa's recalcitrance was balm to his tortured soul. He was profuse and abject in his prostrations until finally even Grandpa relented and we watched misty-eyed as harmony was restored. The siblings vowed they felt belittled that their ma and pa had never supported them so blindly. And Grandma arched her brow at them. How would they know if the support to them had been as silent as that extended to Hari? Naturally, that said the cat among the pigeons. But she insisted it would have to wait for another day, when the time was right, as Lena's story about Ramya and Hari's remembrance had triggered this revelation, as nothing would have made her say otherwise. Grandpa wagged his finger at them, saying they'd given their parents plenty grief too, not a doubt of it. After the turbulent events of the evening, Grandma and Grandpa's joking was a loving sweetness and the magic circle of the family was restored. And we all marveled at Grandma's seemingly inexhaustible cache of family stories. <laughs>